Hey everybody, this is Pastor James. Welcome back to Pioneer Baptist Church. We're continuing in our series today on building Christian homes. Grab your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll begin as soon as we pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the gift of your word. Bless our families. We thank you for fathers and mothers, friends, grandmothers and grandfathers, brothers and sisters, and especially our spouses. Father, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to experience what true love is in this crooked world. We're thankful, O oh God, that in the family we have this great help. We pray, God, you'd help us to understand it better and give us the confidence, Lord, to change the ways that we're broken and to submit to you and your word as we try to become more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. So in the book of Ephesians, we see a great passage on Christian living in the home. This is a great passage to remind us of what people's roles are, how they're supposed to act, and why they're supposed to act that way. What I want to encourage you with right away is that the world and how it views um, men in general is pretty negative these days. The reason for that is because of a spiritual battle that's happening. The reason is there's a philosophy that's being promoted in this world which would tell you that because men are corrupt, you cannot follow men at all. And we experience this every single day. It's not an impractical truth. The truth is politicians, people who are in charge of our lives, they oftentimes let us down. They use their authority for their own good and not the good of the people around them. Likewise, in Christian homes and non-Christian homes, men are sinful. Uh, oftentimes, they will abdicate their responsibilities. They will act impulsively. They will not treat their families with love, tenderness, and respect. They will not serve their families. They will serve their own lusts. This is what we do. This is because we're sinners, and the world has noticed Satan twists this truth to the point of absurdium, where we want to use words like patriarchy to categorize every man who has power or authority, which is ridiculous because all around the world, men have authority. And it's not just because of some system that was set up. It's because we are physically stronger. We have been blessed by God from the Garden of Eden with a role to have dominion over the earth to cultivate it, to make it submit to us. And brothers and sisters, this is a gift from God, not a curse. And what we have is the responsibility now to do with that power and that authority what God would have us to do. The lost world says you can't trust the patriarchy. And in a way, they are right. In a way, they're right. Because we're sinners and we're going to let them down. But God has given us freedom from our sins and our corruption in Christ. And if we will accept Christ and his forgiveness and learn to love and live the way that he wants us to live, then this system that is set up will bless us and it won't be a curse to us anymore. So we have the patriarchy that people are ardently against. But that's not the only thing. Uh, sin has corrupted man and we have become known as misogynistic. If we think that men are better than women in anything, we are misogynistic. We act like we hate women. We act like we use them for our pleasures. And brothers and sisters, we should not be doing that. But the lost world is right in recognizing that most men do. Again, because we're sinners, we treat people in a way that is ungodly. Now, we don't limit that mistreatment to women, but we call it misogyny, and it's a popular talking point today. We're actually ungodly and self-seeking and destructive towards every relationship that we have, at least apart from Christ. That's how we act. But brothers, sisters, I want to encourage us today. God has given us clear direction in his word, and he has told us that the way that you teach people to live and to love and to be developed is within a home. And brothers and sisters, we are learning about building Christian homes. Maybe you're here today and you are a little more leaning to the um, left or liberal talking points or the woke talking points, however you want to phrase it. Um, you are sick of the patriarchy and want to cast it off. You are sick of misogyny and you want to see it rooted out. You 
believe that men are corrupt and they don't deserve to have power and authority over you. I can tell you today, and I can promise you today, that if you will listen to this message and if you will absorb what God is telling men to do, then you will have a better idea of the fact that this is not an irreversible situation. And the solution is absolutely not to teach men to give away their responsibility, which is what the problem is in the first place. And what we want to do is see that in God's economy, in the way that he provides for us, the way that he commands us, in the way that he directs us, then brothers and sisters, that the order that he has given to the home will be able to be taught to our children. Our sons will grow up to be good men and not corrupt evil tyrants. And this happens when we intentionally listen to God in the home. So I know that there are some feelings out there that are going to be hurt, but I want you to hear God's commands and his reasons today. As we consider last week, we learned that men are the head of the home. God has given us headship, authority, and we, brothers and sisters, need to use that appropriately. God didn't make us guess at what that would look like. He tells us today clearly what that looks like so that we can emulate it when we go home after the service. In Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 21, and we're going to read down through um, verse 33. This is to give us context, but we're really going to be focusing just on verse 25 this morning. So let's read it together. It says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present himself, the church, in all her glory, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body. For, the re for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Brothers, sisters, as we dive into the text today, you'll be reminded of many things that we've discussed over the previous weeks. We realize that man has the headship over the home, and we realize that that was rooted in the Genesis narrative. One of the problems of the curse of Eve was that her husband would rule over her. And we talked about how that could actually be a blessing in a sinful world where we need order, where chaos wants to reign. God gave us structure, and we can be thankful for that. Now, what we want to do is we want to expound on that today. Men, you are the heads of your home. Your wives are commanded to be subject to you. Now, this is going to be expanded on more next week. But what I want to encourage you today is that the Bible doesn't tell you to enjoy that subjugation and to abuse that subjugation like most men in the world would do. We are not kings and she is not our slave. No, brothers and sisters, God tells us exactly what we're supposed to do with our headship and with our authority. He tells us, that we are to love our wives. He commands it. Four times it's stated in this passage, but three times it's commanded. It sounds a whole lot like the great, com um, the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment starts in the home, and it starts with the husband and how he treats his wife. Your wife is going to be vulnerable to you. She is going to depend upon you. You must love her. 
Now, the type of love can be confusing. Our world, we get pervert, perverted versions of love all the time. We think of sexual love. We think of lust of uh, the teenage years where we're emotionally wrapped up, where we get swept away in a spirit of grandeur. And then we know that that is love. That's true love. I feel it in my belly is what we'll say or something like that. But the truth is that is all perverse. That is all short of the good love that God wants a husband to give his wife. The word for love here has nothing to do with eroticism. It has not even anything to do with friendship. What it has to do is with selfless, active love. It is the word agape. It is the word in which the Bible uses to describe God's action um, and love towards us. So how are we called to love our wives? Like God loves us. And he didn't just say, this is some ethereal thing that you can make up and you can make fit into a mold of your own. No, he made his own mold and he gave us an example that's concrete. He said, we are to love our wives. In other words, we're going to actively, selflessly love our wives just like God loves us. And we're going to do it based on the example of Jesus and how he loves the church. Look at what it says. Why, I'm sorry, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You understand that the church is the body of believers, the people who have trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus came when we were not seeking him, while we were still in our sins, and he patiently lived beside us, abandoning his authority, his righteousness, and everything that he had while he existed in the form of God in heaven. He, he abandoned it all. He humbled himself, took on the form of a man. He lived on this earth serving us that we might be set free so that our sins could be washed away, so that we could become what God wanted us to be. This is what Jesus did for the church. He came to die for those people who would live for him. We're told that one day the church is going to be Jesus's bride. And what he is doing is he's coming down to sanctify and cleanse and make holy his bride, his people whom he loves, whom he cherishes. And that is the love in which we are supposed to love our wives. So men, you're commanded, love your wives as Christ loves the church and laid himself down, laid his life down for her. So I want you to understand something right away. As a man, what you must do is have the attitude that Christ had towards the church, which is all of his power, all of his authority, all of his high-ranking positions, everything was abandoned for the sake of making the church into what it was created to be. And brothers we are Christ representative here on earth to the lost, but we are also Christ representative here on earth to our families. And what we are entrusted with is the responsibility to shape the way that our family views God and how they view the world. And that example starts with us and how we treat them. We must love them the way that God loves them. Now we are not saviors of the world. That's what Christ did. But what we are is his ambassadors now, and we testify about what Christ did, and we love people with a selfless act of love so that they might become what it is that God has created them to be. But do you know where that starts? With your wife. You should be concerned about presenting her to Christ as his bride one day, spotless. He has made men the priests of their home. You are responsible. We learned in Deuteronomy back uh, a few weeks ago, you are responsible for teaching your children and leading them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is what your job is. You're supposed to serve them, help them to get rid of their corruption, find freedom in Christ, and follow after him passionately and to love him deeply all their days. Your goal is is to present them spotless before God, before the throne. So what does that mean? You're supposed to love your people enough that you would abandon your authority, you would abandon your way of life so that they might become what God wants them to be. You would empty yourself 
so that they might become what God intended for them to be, that they might come to know him in salvation and that they might do away with sin as they walk on this earth so that you can present them one day before God uncorrupted. That's your job. Christ has commanded us, love our wives as he loved the church. Listen to what it says. It says, Christ, um, so that he might sanctify her, that's Christ, so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Do you know how you get sin and dirt and grime and corruption? Do you know how you get the philosophies of this world and demonic influence out? By using the word of God to cleanse the people you love. Now, how does this look? Well, a very simple illustration would be something kind of like this. A man gets in trouble with his wife. And the cliche would be, she's mad at me, give her a few days, she'll get over it, right? And then we'll go back to doing whatever we're doing, right? We don't really change. We just kind of have learned to live with each other. We adjust it. That is a ungodly way to live. Why? Because we know what God has told us to do, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. If your wife is angry at you and it takes her six days to get over it, then what we have to do is, as husbands, we need to humble ourselves. We need to come alongside of her and be patient. And we need to tenderly teach her that the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I love you too much for you to waste six days of your fleeting life being filled with anger. God is meant for us to live with forgiveness and joy. And I'm sorry for what I've done. I will gladly accept responsibility for it all, but we need to reconcile and your heart needs to be at peace. That's different, isn't it? We are supposed to love our wives. We are supposed to serve them, help them to be who God wants them to be. We are supposed to treat them like Christ treated the church. And it says that he cleansed the church with the washing of the word. And so, brothers, you must be the priest of your home and you must know the word of God. You must. And I don't care how you choose to get it into your system, whether it's listening to it online or reading it yourself or listening to sermons or asking your pastor, but you've got to get it in you. You've got to get the word of God in you so that you can lead your home and so that you won't be corrupted in your leadership of that home. So we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loved the church, and we are supposed to wash our wives with the water of the word so that we can present her to Christ one day without blemish. In verse 25, it says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. I want you to notice the limitations on this love. God doesn't tell you to love your wives to the detriment of yourself. He says to love your wives as yourself. In fact, he refers us back to this passage from Genesis that reminds us we're actually one flesh. And when we love our wives as ourselves, we actually are loving ourselves. It is actually, in a really weird way, a selfish love. When we treat our wives in a godly way and she becomes, we wash her with the, war, with the word of God, and she becomes what God has created her to be, our lives, our lives become better as well. It serves us to come home to a woman who is filled with joy. It serves us well to serve to come home to a woman who's delighted in helping with the work that God has set before us. It is a it is a service that we do to ourselves when we don't have to fight against the drag of people who aren't going the same direction as us in our homes. You understand brothers and sisters, if we will serve as husbands our wives and we will love them as we love ourselves then brothers and sisters, we will become what God wants us to be and our homes will be blessed. Here's how it goes. Husband, if your wife is in pain, if she's suffering, if she needs direction, if she's doing something wrong, then what should you do? Oh, you should in love and in patience and in, and in, and in um, uh, gentleness, you should definitely correct her. That's what you should do. You should also praise her when she does right. You should also affirm who she is in Christ and who she is in your eyes. You should build her up and not tear her down. Every action that you take on her behalf would be to build her up and make her into what 
she was intended to be in Christ. And so, brother, I need you to love your wife like you would love yourself. If you were doing something wrong, wouldn't you want to know how to do it right? If you were doing something wrong and you had to learn how to do it right, wouldn't you want someone to come alongside of you and help you with it? If you were alone in this world and you just wanted to know that you were a part of something, wouldn't you be quick to ask other people to let them know what they think of you? Wouldn't you want to hear their feedback? I just, I'm just telling you, brothers, you need to treat your wives the way that you want to be treated. You need to love them. Because when you love them, it's like you're loving yourself. You're making your home better. When you love them, you are making your wife better and you are making your kingdom better. And so I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Listen to what it says. It says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and become joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. What Paul's doing here is he's talking about how the relationship between Jesus and the church is like the relationship between a husband and a wife. I told you all over the last few weeks that this um, order, this structure that God gave us, is not arbitrary. And it wasn't just for one point in history. It is something there's something about the way that God structured the home that teaches us about who he is, who we are, and what we will be one day. And in following his structure, we see a, a alleviation from the corruption of sin. We see protection from the corruption of sin. We see love and we see the ability to live life the way it was intended to be by God's grace inside the structure. And brothers... The Bible commands us to build our home upon the love of God and then the love of others, starting with our wife. We are commanded to love our wife. It doesn't matter how you feel about her. It doesn't matter if she gives you butterflies. We are to treat her like Christ treated the church. Our goal is not that she will be ooey-gooey in love with us. Our goal is that she will look like a bride, spotless one day when she stands before her God. Our goal is to help her to become what God created her to become. And that also includes being a helper to you, which is wonderful. But your goal, brothers, is not to make her into your image or make her into what you want, but to make her into what God wants her to be. You need to love her enough to help her do that. Finally, in verse 33, it says, Nevertheless, each individual among you is also to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Next week, we're going to talk about wives respecting husbands, but because that's what they're commanded to do. But men, you are commanded to love your wife. You need to be active. You need to be proactive. You need to be selfless. The goal of your love is to make her into whom God wanted her to be. Help her to take off the sinfulness. Help her to put on the garments of joy and peace and all the fruits of the Spirit. Your job as God's ambassador is to lead her the way that Christ led the church. Patiently, gently, selflessly. And as you do this, brothers, your home will begin to change. Many of you will be tempted to think that I'm asking you to give up on your hobbies on the long-term goals you have for your family. You might think that I'm making light of your current struggle and your relationship issues, but I'm not. What I'm giving you is a pillar of truth. God made the home. He made marriage. It's good. He made it between a husband and a wife. It's awesome. And now, in order to start building on those foundations, you must love your wife. It's a decision you have to make by faith, regardless of what she does for you, because you see that doing God's will for your life will help build his kingdom here. It will bring him joy. It will delight God. And what you want to do is do the things that are glorifying to God. So I want to encourage you today, brother, wherever you are, start loving your wife. Go to her today and apologize for where you failed her and encourage her, build her up. I'm not saying you have to tell her, I'm going to be the priest. You're going to listen to me. No, I want you to treat her tenderly like Christ treated the church. Think of how he treated the woman at the well in Samaria. Think about how he treat, treated the woman caught in adultery. Think about how he treated his mother. And think about how he treated the 
Mary Magdalene and Martha. We have examples of how, how Jesus treated women all over the place. And I want to encourage you, it's not arbitrary. You are patiently shaping them into what God has created them to be. You are their priest. You are their ruler. You are the head of the household. So you must love them like Christ loves you. I hope that you guys are challenged by this, and I hope it's practical enough for you. If you have any questions, hit me up in the comments below or at contactpioneerbaptist at gmail.com. I love you guys. Hope to see you next week for another good sermon.